Hey, this is Matt with Elevation Recovery. Welcome to the video. It's going to be a really informative and helpful one. In this video, I'm going to cover the opioid withdrawal timeline and opioid withdrawal symptoms. We're going to cover the science of opioid dependence and how that works in the brain and body. And we're also going to talk about the science of the opioid withdrawal syndrome and all the little components that are happening that make it feel so awful. I'm also going to cover the acute withdrawal symptoms of opioids and the post-acute withdrawal symptoms from coming off opioids. I'm also going to go really in depth on these because depending on whether or not you've been taking a short acting opioid or a long acting opioid or an extended release acting opioid, uh, whether you've been tapering or you're doing a cold turkey, how long you've been on it, all these are components that can contribute to how long the opioid withdrawal timeline will last, how long acute withdrawal and post acute withdrawal will last on average. So a lot of stuff we're going to cover. This is a big training video. One of the things I've realized a long time ago about opioids is there are many different types of opioids. There are so many different types. First, let's cover, well, what is an opioid? Basically, an opioid is any substance that binds to the opioid receptors that you have in your brain, in your spinal cord, in your digestive tract, and other areas of your body. Opioids can be totally natural, such as the opium poppy plant contains natural opioid alkaloids, as does the kratom plant. Many of the opioids that are taken on a regular basis today are either semi-synthetic or fully synthetic opioids. So it's semi-synthetic is when there is a natural component to the opioid, but it has been also manipulated by man or woman or both to create something that was first natural and then they synthesized it, but it still has some of the natural element. A synthetic opioid is something completely made in the laboratory that has no bears nothing to natural compounds in nature. So how do opioids work? Well, what happens is we already have mu opioid receptors in our brain. And when we exercise or eat certain foods or do other activities that stimulates the natural production of endorphin and enkephalin, which are natural painkillers. When you take any type of opioid drug, what happens is the drug binds to the mu opioid receptors in your brain and body, and then the receptors turn on and they activate the release of a whole lot of endorphin, enkephalin, and dopamine. Some of the effects of opioids are pain relief, sedation, euphoria, Energy is the opposite effect that happens with a lot of people. Constricted pupils and constipation. Some people even get nauseous and dizzy and itchy from opioids. Now let's talk about tolerance and dependence of opioids. The science of tolerance states that the more regularly you use a substance, in this case opioids, the more your body develops a tolerance to it. Tolerance means that you need more and more of the substance to achieve the same desired effect. So for instance, for eight years, I was able to take opioids irregularly, you know, maybe a few times a month. Sometimes I wouldn't take them for months because I didn't have a regular supply. And even if I did, I probably wouldn't have, I didn't have much money back then. I just didn't see the point in taking them every day. So for eight years, they were great for me as a resource for anxiety, for depression, uh, for being more confident with women, for getting euphoric and lots of energy. So they were great. But in upstate New York, when I was about 29 or 30, I started using opioids on a day-to-day -day basis. Within about two weeks or less, I started to get a really, really big tolerance. I needed more pills and they weren't doing nearly as much as they were in the first week. What I've also found is some people have these biological innate high tolerances to opioids. I did. The first time I ever snorted a 40 milligram Oxycontin, the biggest dose I had taken Prior to that was maybe two or three or four Vicodins over the span of a few hours. Five milligram hydrocodones. And I had never snorted them up until that point. So when I snorted my first 40 milligram Oxycontin with a bunch of my friends, and most of my friends were vomiting, itching, just as sick as can be, they were totally debilitated. Meanwhile, my friend and I were jumping up and down full of energy and confidence and we were relaxed and energized simultaneously. So what I've noticed is that the people that have these innate high opioid tolerances and when opioids give them energy, especially if opioids give people energy, that is the prime predictor of who is higher at risk of becoming addicted. I am very surprised in the practice of pain clinics and doctors across the United States and other countries that they're not doing this. What I would do is, you know, after a patient takes their very first dose of an opioid painkiller, 
If it makes them feel really energized and confident and it makes them hypomanic, it's like bipolar two, there's something called hypomania. Opioids for a lot of people, instead of making them tired and sedated and itchy and nauseous and just not feeling into it, it'll be like a nootropic. It'll give some people hypomania, making them feel super confident and energized and they take risks. They feel like they can get anything done. This resembles hy hypomania from bipolar 2. It is an elevated state of mental and physical energy. So a lot of people will get hooked on opioids due to the hypomania that it activates within them. However, the science of tolerance applies to these individuals as well as the people that opioids have the normal and non-energy enhancing effects. One of the things that really sucks about opioids is you can get a tolerance to these things really quickly really, really fast. Some people within two weeks, some people within three weeks. Some people develop opioid tolerance faster than others, and that has to do with their individual biochemistry and genetics as well. Now we're going to cover the science of opioid dependence. The science of opioid physiological dependence states that through prolonged opioid daily use, Eventually, whether it takes four weeks or five weeks or six weeks, depending on the person, eventually their neurons become adapted to the presence of the opioids. And when the neurons in your brain, have, they actually adapt to the presence of the drug, what that means is they need the opioids now. Your brain has become rewired to need opioids to feel normal. That's physiological dependence. And so once you have a physiological dependence to these opioid drugs, if you stop taking them cold turkey, that is, if you abruptly discontinue opioids, when you have a physiological dependence, you're going to go through some type of an opioid withdrawal syndrome, mild, moderate, severe, or the worst thing in your entire life. Now let's cover the opioid withdrawal syndrome. And to do that, I'm going to talk about the first time I ever went through opioid withdrawal. I was living in a small town of 7,000 people called Norwich in upstate New York, right smack dab in the middle of central New York. And I had been taking opioids for two months straight, mostly Oxycontin that I was snorting or Norcos or Vicodin or Percocet that I was swallowing, some morphine here and there, but mostly it was Oxycontin or oxycodone. And I had been using a lot of pills every single day, usually over 100 milligrams a day, sometimes over 200 milligrams for those two months, just having a great time, having fun. They were helping me work, feel awesome, feel energized, hook up with girls, be confident. You know, they were just awesome. I had no idea at a single point that if I were to run out of these pills and stop taking them, that I'd get sick like I did, just like a heroin addict, you know? I had no idea, totally clueless. Even though in the past I had gone through alcohol withdrawal, let's see, cannabis withdrawal, benzo withdrawal, Paxil withdrawal, methamphetamine withdrawal, which was easy, the easiest one by far. It wasn't, you just slept, I just slept for like five days. But why I didn't think that could happen with prescription opioid pills, I have no idea. No idea. I was just an idiot back then. So here's what happened. After two months of daily use of opioids, and remember, all of most of my 20s, from 22 to around 30, I was able to use opioids recreationally from time to time with no issues. What are you, what are you doing climbing over there, huh? Want to say hi to the audience? This is Papaya right here. She's my sidekick. But it was a Saturday night and I texted all my dealers and nobody could get any pills. I was almost out. I had a few 10 milligram Norcos left. So Sunday morning, I woke up, took one of my 10 milligram Norcos. And then that afternoon, I took my last 10 milligram Norco and then I was out of pills. Went to bed on Sunday night, didn't think anything of it. Woke up Monday morning, went into work. I got there at eight, drank a big cup of coffee, went downstairs, vomited the whole cup of coffee up and proceeded to have the biggest panic attack of my entire life. And I didn't know that it was from opioid withdrawal. I didn't know. I had no idea. Not from just taking them for two months. The thought did not even cross my mind. My boss took one look at me after I ran downstairs, vomited, came back up. He looked at how panicked I was. I was sweating. He's like, man, you need to go home, get some rest. It's okay. We'll take care of it. Oh, so I still thought I was having a panic attack. I didn't know it was withdrawal. And even if I did know that it was withdrawal, I didn't have anyone to get pills. So long story short, I started going through my first opioid withdrawal. 
Well, actually, let's go, let's go deeper into it. All right, remember, I was coming off of two months of daily short-acting opioids, probably more than 100 milligrams a day on most days. Day one sucked really bad, really, really bad. I was anxious, my stomach hurt. I drank a 12-pack of alcohol to be able to go to sleep. That was a dumb idea because even though it helped me get through day one, the next day I woke up and day two of withdrawal was worse and I still didn't know I was going through withdrawal. I was like, why do I feel like this? The symptoms got worse and now I was hung over from drinking a 12 pack as well. Alcohol during opioid withdrawal is usually one of the worst things you can do. It can help some people feel better in the moment, but as soon as they stop drinking the alcohol, it usually makes the opioid withdrawal so much worse. My day three got even more severe. By that point, I had learned that I was going through opioid withdrawal. Uh, one of my dealers texted me and they're like, you're still sick? You're going through opioid withdrawal. I was like, there's no way. I've only been on them two months. He's like, that's more than long enough and you've been taking a lot. So there I had it. I knew I was going through withdrawal. By day four of opioid withdrawal, that was so bad. It got worse every single day. Coming off short acting opioids, and we're gonna go deeper into this coming up. But my day one sucked. My day two was way worse. My days three and four were way more severe. It escalated. Day five, it started to get a lot easier. It still sucked, but it started to like, okay, I think the severe part's done. At that point, I also managed to get a whole bunch of Valium as well. And as soon as I started to take the Valium on about the middle of day five, things were fine. I started to feel really good. The only problem was after seven days of no opioids, and I was feeling good by then, I had Valium. I had only used them two months. There was no post-acute withdrawal from two months of use. I was young. I was like 30. And remember, I had a bunch of Valiums. That was the biggest key. Seven days, no opioids. And then Someone texted me that they had a whole bunch of Oxycontin, 80 milligrams again, and I had just got paid a few days earlier. Went and started snorting Oxycontin again. Well, after just going through the worst experience probably of my entire life, my first opioid withdrawal. The lunacy of that, the lunacy of that. But I know I'm not the only person in the world that's done that, right? Why did using opioids for only two months daily cause such a severe opioid withdrawal syndrome? It's because I first got a tolerance, then I got a dependence, then I got a bigger dependence, then I stopped cold turkey, an abrupt cessation, once my neurons had become adapted to the presence of the opioids, and when I stopped taking them cold turkey, my blood opioid concentration fell rapidly and rapidly to where about 12 hours after my last dosage of the 10 milligrams of Norco, my blood opioid concentration had plummeted so much that that started the first mild part of the acute opioid withdrawal. And it, things just kept getting worse and worse and worse throughout the first couple of days, all the way to day four. Then it started to get easier. That was my first withdrawal. And that's how it happened. From a state of opioid physiological dependence, when you stop cold turkey, your blood opioid concentration goes down and it activates a few things. Most importantly, the central nervous system rebound effect. Remember, opioids are CNS depressants. They depress the central nervous system. Even if they give you energy, they're still CNS depressants overall. So when your neurons become adapted to this CNS depressant, they depress, they depress, they depress, and you're down here for those two months daily, my CNS was very depressed by the opioids. When my blood opioid concentration started to fall rapidly after my last dosage, within 12 hours, around 12 hours, I started to get my first symptoms. That was because of the CNS rebound effect. We're gonna talk about that now. So from a state of physiological dependence to opioids, when I went abruptly off those, my blood opioid concentration plummeted very quickly. That activated the locus coeruleus in my brain to cause the autonomic nervous system fight or flight response. And the division of the autonomic nervous system that it activates is the sympathetic nervous system. The amygdala is the fear center of your brain and it goes crazy. Your brain releases a cascade of stress hormones like adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. And so in effect, once the blood opioid concentration plummets down below dependence levels, then the CNS that you've been depressing 
instead of going back to your normal baseline, it skyrockets way past baseline, rebounds when you've been holding something down, pushing something down, depressing it, depressing it, keep taking opioids, keep taking opioids, keep taking opioids. Then you stop cold turkey, boom, and it just goes way up. Your brain activates adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, fight or flight response to the millionth degree and unlike our hunter-gatherer ancestors, if they saw a saber-toothed tiger, they would activate the sympathetic nervous system fight-or-flight response. It would force all their blood to their legs and to their muscles and take it all away, all the energy from digestion and immune system, all the rest stuff, parasympathetic nervous system activation. It activates adrenaline and noradrenaline and cortisol, and it gives you energy and focus to be able to either fight freeze or flee if you have to. Let's say in this case, they do make it to safety and successfully flee the saber-toothed tiger. In about 15 minutes, their sympathetic nervous system fight or flight response is going to calm the F down. The parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest division of the autonomic nervous system kicks in and then all of a sudden they can relax. They can, they have an appetite again. They could sleep later that night if they want to. Acute opioid withdrawal, this fight or flight system does not stop. It does not stop. It doesn't stop on its own. It has to work its way through the course. That is such a reason why people are so afraid of the opioid withdrawal syndrome. It can make you feel like you wish you were dead. It's so bad. The psychological withdrawal symptoms, the physical withdrawal symptoms, which we're going to cover deeply coming up, and synergize together with the physical and the psychological. It will make the strongest Navy SEAL in the world. It'll bring them to their knees as well. It doesn't matter who you are, how badass you are. When you go through a severe acute opioid withdrawal, it is awful and terrifying. Now let's talk about yet another rebound effect during acute opioid withdrawal syndrome. That's the constipation rebound effect. Opioids are constipating drugs. When I first started using them recreationally when I was around 22, I would notice that when I would take hydrocodone, which is the only one I had back then for at least the first year, the next morning after taking it, I'd be totally constipated. That's one of the effects of opioids. So after you take them for a prolonged period of time, that becomes your new baseline. You're constipating, you're constipating, you're constipating. Then if you stop taking them cold turkey, and again, your blood opioid concentration plummets, uh, depending on a short-acting or a long-acting opioid, that could take 12 hours, that could take 24 or 48 hours. It depends on a lot of things, which we're going to cover. But as soon as your blood opioid concentration dips down beneath your dependence level required to make you feel normal, along with the CNS rebound effect, you get the uh, constipation rebound effect. So again, you've been going down, pushing it down, pushing it down, taking opioids daily, prolonged period of time, constipating effect, constipating effect, new normal. Abrupt cessation of opioids, cold turkey detox, blood concentration goes down, constipation effect, doesn't go back to baseline, you've been stuffing it, remember it goes boing, way, 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 way up high. So, so we're going to cover the symptoms in detail coming up, but I think you can get a picture of it, a constipation rebound effect. What's the opposite of constipation? Diarrhea. Unfortunately, it's not just diarrhea, it's stomach cramping, it's nausea, it's stomach pain. There can be so many different issues with the stomach. You can't eat, or if you can, you can't hold anything down. So you've got the physical symptoms, the psychological symptoms, the stomach symptoms, the central nervous system symptoms. It's just opioid withdrawal is crazy. I've gone through a lot of different drug withdrawals. By far, by far, by far, by far, opioid withdrawal, at least for me, was by far the hardest. So there's two classes of opioid withdrawal symptoms, whether it's the acute withdrawal symptoms or the post-acute withdrawal symptoms, which we are going to cover coming up. But first, two classes of opioid withdrawal symptoms. First class is physical withdrawal symptoms, things like diarrhea and stomach cramping, sweating, hot goose flesh, you know, hot and cold flashes, physical symptoms. And there's many more too, which we'll cover. Then there's psychological symptoms, anxiety, depression, fear, confusion, inability to focus, and much more. 
The real bitch is that there's a huge synergy between the physical and the psychological symptoms. If it was just the physical symptoms, if it was just the physical symptoms, but you're and you felt good psychologically, it wouldn't even be one tenth as bad. The main reason opioid withdrawal is not like just having the flu for a week, like so many naive and ignorant individuals believe. The reason opioid withdrawal is so horrific is because not only is it usually for a lot of people way worse than any flu they've ever had, but on top of that, the anxiety, the fear, the insomnia and the restless legs and all the psychological and severe physical and severe psychological symptoms together equals synergy. Synergy means that one plus one does not equal two. It equals three or more. That's why opioid withdrawal is so horrific. The physical symptoms are awful. The psychological symptoms are even way more awful. And when you couple those together, your whole body is going through so much that it is one of the most feared withdrawals there are. Now let's cover the acute opioid withdrawal timeline. And remember, I said at the beginning, these can vary quite a bit, mostly depending on the type of opioid a person's taking, also, there are many other considerations as well, like how much they've been taking, uh, for how long they've been taking it, and others. First, we'll cover the short-acting opioid acute withdrawal timeline. Here's a pretty common example of what this looks like. The first day doesn't feel good whatsoever. The second day gets a whole lot worse. Maybe it doubles in intensity and severity. And then days three to four, the peak of the opioid withdrawal symptom severity. So again, it's about four days long. On the fifth day, you wake up and it still sucks, but it's not nearly as severe as days three and four were. So typically it goes day one sucks, day two sucks way worse, and days three and four are the suckiest. And then day five, it sucks, but it's kind of the acute withdrawal is typically over. Uh, sometimes it can last up to seven days or longer coming off of short-acting opioids. It depends on many different factors, but typically it's four days for the acute withdrawal timeline coming off short-acting opioids. But again, this can vary. One of the factors is how fast or slow an individual's opioid metabolism is that can determine whether their opioid withdrawal coming off short-acting opioids is going to be four, five, six, seven, or a different number of days. Now let's cover the acute withdrawal timeline coming off of long-acting opioids. Long-acting opioids, things like methadone, suboxone, subutex, etc. These are slow onset and slow offset. So when you take short-acting opioids, they kick in pretty quick and they wear off pretty quick. That means that when you stop taking them, they come out of your body pretty quick. You get through the withdrawal pretty quick. With these long-acting opioids, again, suboxone, subutex, uh, methadone, now, when you take these, they take a long time to kick in and very slow. There's not like this. You take them and you get this rush. It takes several hours and hours and hours to start kicking in, and then it gradually wears off. They, they bind to your opioid receptors much stronger, especially buprenorphine. It has a very high binding affinity to the opioid receptors. It's very sticky. So after you've been taking these drugs, if you were to stop cold turkey, you're not going to probably get withdrawal symptoms 12 hours after your last dosage. No way. That's short-acting opioids. Usually the withdrawal symptoms start anywhere from three to seven or maybe even up to 10 days after a person does an acute withdrawal off of a long-acting opioid. So some people will quit, say they come off of a Suboxone cold turkey and they've been on it for two years. Well, they might feel really fine the first couple of days, but by day three, usually they start, if they haven't felt bad before uh, during days one and two, usually by day three or by day four, or for some people day five. It, eventually, if they're coming off cold turkey after a prolonged period of time, it's usually just a matter of days before the buprenorphine in the suboxone starts to finally come out of the receptors. Remember, it's really sticky and it's really long acting. So it takes so much longer for buprenorphine or methadone to come out of someone's receptors that the withdrawal syndrome, the acute withdrawal syndrome, takes longer to begin after your last dosage of a long-acting opioid, and it usually lasts longer too. So maybe it lasts 7 to 14 days or maybe, maybe even up to 21 days. It could even be longer. I've had patients when I was a counselor at a methadone clinic a long time ago that came off of methadone after they'd been on it for many, many, many years, cold turkey in jail, and 
came out of jail after months and telling me that their acute withdrawal, some of them up to two months, you know, no sleep, going diarrhea, just horrible, horrible, horrible. That's what happens when you're on 180 milligrams of methadone. You get arrested and go to jail. So he was going through withdrawal in jail, cold turkey methadone. So it can take a while to do an acute withdrawal when you're coming off of these long-acting opioids. With the short-acting opioids, the withdrawal is usually a lot more straightforward. With the long-acting opioids, the withdrawal, the acute withdrawal, there can be a lot of differences, a lot more kind of wiggle room regarding how long it's going to take for an individual. But kind of general rule of thumb that is pretty typical for a large percentage of the population Short-acting opioid withdrawal timeline, acute withdrawal four to seven days. Long-acting acute withdrawal opioid withdrawal timeline, maybe seven to 14 days. The best way in the world to prevent an acute withdrawal coming off opioids from happening, whether you're coming off short-acting or long-acting opioids, is to taper. Tapering slowly helps to reduce shock to your brain and body. Remember, an acute withdrawal your blood opioid concentration goes down really fast. So if it's short-acting opioids, extremely fast. Long-acting opioids, it's a much more drawn-out process. But when you taper, that is reducing your opioid dosage at uh, predictable increments, at pre-planned increments in dosages. Say, for instance, you start off taking 10% of your dosage for the first week. And then every seven days, over the span of maybe a year, let's say for an example, you're reducing your dosage slowly over time. What that does is that slowly gets your brain and your body more used to these lower opioid dosages. So in effect, you are effectively lowering your opioid dosage at a slow enough speed to where it's not too hard on your brain and body to where you can keep stepping down, stepping down. And then for people that do that very, very well, they can actually come off of opioids out, if they taper really, really well, then they can bypass the acute withdrawal syndrome. Now, they might have post-acute withdrawal. They might still feel a slightly bad, moderately bad, or even it might be very hard even tapering off. But if you do tapering correctly and really well, that should at least bypass the acute withdrawal phase. And on top of that, I've also seen people that have had very mild and very short pause, maybe even not even pause, just maybe like a week or two of just feeling not as much energy, their moods down after they've transitioned completely off of a taper. You know, usually everyone feels at least some difference, at least some drop in energy, at least some drop in their overall mood once they transition off an opioid taper, even if it was a really good taper. That being said, it's not like coming off acute withdrawal. So they, they still can avoid that horrific acute withdrawal syndrome that is one of the worst things I've ever gone through in my entire life. Now that we've covered the acute withdrawal timeline for both short-acting opioids and long-acting opioids, let's cover post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Post-acute withdrawal syndrome, also known as PAUSE, is a biopsychosocial syndrome that results from the combination of the damage that drugs have done to the brain combined with the stress of living life without a substance that you've been so accustomed to using and needing. To accurately and simply define post-acute withdrawal syndrome or pause, let's go through it and break down the meaning of each word. Post means after, acute means very serious or dangerous, requiring serious attention or action. Withdrawal is the discontinuation of administration or use of a drug. Syndrome is a group of symptoms. Simply put, pause is a group of symptoms that occur after an individual has gone through the serious withdrawal phase induced by the discontinuation of narcotic drugs. In his popular book, Staying Sober, Terence Gorski states, Post-acute withdrawal is a group of symptoms of addictive disease that occur as a result of an abstinence from addictive chemicals. In the alcoholic slash addict, these symptoms appear 7 to 14 days into abstinence after stabilization from the acute withdrawal. Post-acute withdrawal is a biopsychosocial syndrome. It results from a combination of damage to the nervous system caused by alcohol or drugs and the psychosocial stress of coping with life without drugs or alcohol. Regarding pause, a lot of the symptoms are actually kind of a continuation of the acute opioid withdrawal symptoms. So some of the worst and common opioid withdrawal symptoms for acute withdrawal are things like severe anxiety, insomnia, fear, stomach ache, nausea, diarrhea, hot and cold flashes, goose flesh, sneezing, teary eyes, runny nose, diarrhea, restless leg syndrome, 
restless limbs, restless mind, more susceptible to both physical and psychological pain, more sensitive to cold temperatures, more emotionally raw with no protective barrier, vomiting, lack of appetite, depression, losing the will to live, thinking that things are much worse in life than they really are because of the state of your brain, what it's going through. And when it comes to the post-acute withdrawal syndrome symptoms, many of them are identical or similar to the acute withdrawal coming off opioids symptoms. So post-acute withdrawal symptoms are things like, you know, anxiety, but nowhere near as bad usually as the acute withdrawal anxiety. Insomnia, but nowhere near as bad as acute withdrawal insomnia. You know, restless arms and legs, but nowhere near as severe as the acute opioid withdrawal, restless legs and restless mind. People can still have temperature and goose flesh issues well into post-acute withdrawal, even, you know, several weeks into it. It's just these symptoms, the pause symptoms tend to linger on. That's what sucks so bad about them. They suck, but they tend to last quite a while. And when you're actually the person that's going through pause... Even if it only takes, you know, even if it only takes six weeks to get to a hundred percent, the, you know, you, you take your last dosage of an opioid, then six weeks later, you're fully healed and you feel great. Even if it takes six weeks, if you're the person going through that six weeks, each, if it's really bad, each day can feel like an eternity. And so when you're the one coming from that brain state of deficiency of deficit and excesses of certain things. Getting through six weeks can seem like six months for some people. It's also important to note that during post-acute withdrawal syndrome, quitting opioids, there are two symptoms that I see take out the most amount of people. One of the symptoms is anhedonia. That is the inability to feel pleasure. I like to call it pleasure deafness. You cannot feel any sort of pleasure whatsoever. So when someone's going through post-acute withdrawal syndrome or pause, after discontinuing opioid drugs, a lot of people will get anhedonia. Some people will just get depression. Maybe some days are okay. Some people get full-blown anhedonia. That's a lack of dopamine issue. There's also many other things going on in their brain, but typically they cannot produce enough dopamine to feel pleasure, to feel even a little bit. It's just complete pleasure, inability to feel. And when you couple that with extreme exhaustion, extreme fatigue, I'm not talking about you're tired or you're fatigued. I'm talking extreme battery pack, completely out of juice. I'm talking the Energizer Bunny, which is what I was like on opioids because they made me feel hypomania. And then what goes up must come down, right? So I was hypomanic, hypomanic on opioids for a long time. Then I stopped. You know, this is the last time I quit, a little over nine years ago. I'd been using years at that point, and I came off cold turkey. And, well, actually, no, I did a methadone switchover. I came off cold turkey, but I used methadone for seven days. So that actually helped me to bypass the acute withdrawal. Great, right? The only problem was I still had to deal with post-acute withdrawal syndrome. And my exhaustion the first week or two, oh, I was so tired. I was sleeping like two or three hours a night. I was really, really tired. I was glued to the couch. You know, I was glued to the couch. So for the first few weeks of my post-acute withdrawal, even though the methadone helped me to bypass the acute withdrawal, because I only used it for seven days, coming off of short-acting heroin opioids, the post-acute withdrawal, I was still fatigued. I was exhausted. I had no energy whatsoever. And I was like 32 years old. When I have clients or when I hear from people that are like 60 years old or 70 years old going through post-acute withdrawal, usually the older a person is and the less active they are in life, the more comorbidities they, they have, you know, usually those people get much more tired. So if you're young, if you're like a 20 year old or 18 or 23 year old, you know, it's, it's probably not going to be nearly as bad the post-acute withdrawal fatigue, someone that's like 70 or something that's been using them for pain management, for example. Now let's talk about the post-acute withdrawal symptoms timeline. Most people, it's at least two to three weeks long. So there's a lot of different situations here, remember. But for the majority of individuals, their post-acute withdrawal syndrome after detoxing from opioids is a minimum of two to three weeks. Uh, a lot of people, it lasts up to four to six weeks. A lot of people, it lasts up to two to three months. 
For a lot of people, it lasts up to four to six months. For a much smaller amount of people, much smaller amount of people, it lasts nine months to a year. For a much, 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 much smaller amount of people, it can last a, a longer than a year. The last time I personally quit opioids, a little over nine years ago, my post-acute withdrawal was about five or six weeks. I was 32 at the time, and it lasted about five or six weeks. And then I started to feel much better after that. Thanks for staying with me till the end. Now you know how opioids work in the brain and body, how tolerance develops, how dependence develops, and what that is, how the opioid withdrawal syndrome functions in the brain and nervous system, what the symptoms are of both acute withdrawal syndrome and post-acute withdrawal syndrome after quitting opioids, and about how long the acute withdrawal timeline can last for short and long-acting opioids, and about how long the post-acute withdrawal timeline can last for short and long-acting opioids. Boy, that was a mouthful. As usual, this was a much longer training than I had intended, but all, as usual, really, really fun teaching you these things. Thanks so much for staying till the end, and I'll see you next time.